Hi, I'm James Verdeer, and welcome to the American Institute of Biological Sciences Bioscience Talks, which is a forum for integrating the life sciences. On the second Wednesday of each month, and sometimes in between, we discuss the latest bioscience publications. And as a reminder, if you'd like to read more, point your browser to academic.oup.com forward slash bioscience. Before we get into today's episode, I wanted to pass along a last reminder about an upcoming professional development program. It's a course being taught by yours truly, and it's called Writing for Impact and Influence. The idea is to help the those in science careers improve their written communication skills so that they feel more comfortable stepping into the fore whenever there's a professional writing opportunity. The focus isn't so much on the mechanics of good writing, it's about motivating your readers to act, and just as importantly, getting the writing done easily and efficiently. But moving on to today's episode, I was joined by Dr. Mitch Cruzan, who's a professor of biology at Portland State University in Portland, Oregon. He's on the show to talk about his new article in bioscience on the slender false brome, which is an invasive grass that has more than a few things to teach us about the way that invasions work more generally, too. Here's our conversation. Dr. Cruzan, thank you very much for joining me today. Well, thank you. Thank you for calling. Okay, so we'll be talking about a very specific invasion, but before we do that, I was hoping you could give us a little bit of a background, you know, on kind of how plant invasions uh, are typically understood to work. Um, And that could be historical or, you know, also working from the new understanding that you describe in your article. Yeah, sure. So, I think that we generally focus on invasive species, uh, really looking at the ones that have been successful. And we don't necessarily appreciate the fact that the large majority of plants and animals that are introduced to new regions are are not successful. And so I actually tell my students that we should um, um, kind of respect the innovators that are, that are successful because they've, uh, they've managed to do this, you know, against uh, a, a lot of odds that are, that are against them. So they have to uh, match a climate. They have to uh, compete with the natives. Um, we think that sometimes they can be uh, released from uh, pathogens or pests uh, in the in invaded range. Um, and in some cases that's turned out to be a, a, a key factor. But in many other times, um, uh, it, it's been more mysterious how invaders uh, succeed. And so the, this particular paper was focused on one particular aspect. It's not generally all invasive species um, are the product of rapid evolution and adaptation. Um, but there's a, a pretty good number that we think are. And so this paper was designed to illustrate one particular well-documented case of an invasive species that appears to have uh, arrived uh, from multiple sources and the what's now spreading in the Pacific Northwest of North America is actually um, a hybrid. Oh, that's interesting. So let's walk through the history a little bit. When did this species, you know, or, or any of the components of the hybrid first arrive and under what circumstances? Yeah, so what we understand, and I have to say that we have had to piece this together based upon pretty fragmented information because there's actually no written documentation that we could find about the activities of the um, of the plant introduction program, the USDA plant introduction program, or of the the scientists working at uh, University of Oregon and Oregon State University. But what we've put together is, um, I think supported by both the uh, record of herbarium specimens and also the genetic analyses that we've conducted. And so what appears to have happened is that um, range managers planted plants from around the world in gardens, uh, one in Corvallis, Oregon, another one in Eugene, Oregon, associated with those universities. Now, why they did this dates back to um, the late 1800s when people were first sort of realizing that there's a lot of plants and animals uh, around the world that might be useful. And we have to kind of keep in mind that the, um, the 
understanding of the potential for uh, you know damage by invaders was just not present at that time and they were more about using plants and animals uh, from around the world for you know, economic advantage or for even ecological advantage that that they felt like they could you know maybe almost create new new communities that would be superior to what was already here and so these in introduction programs um, were fueled to some degree by sec early successes when a pest had arrived. And in particular, in this case, um, the citrus crop in California was um, uh, threatened by um, an insect pest. And, and so somebody had the good idea to go back to the origin, and I think that was Australia, of that particular pest and find its natural predator. And so that led to the introduction of ladybird beetles, or we call um, uh, uh, um, ladybugs sometimes. And so, and there's a number of different species of, of these ladybird beetles, and um, that that uh, that are are now in North America. And so there was a huge success of that in, invasion, and you, you know you still see ladybird beetles being marketed as a great biocontrol agent because. Their larvae are, are voracious. They'll just eat up all of the aphids on the leaves of any plant. And so from that success, people got pretty excited about the potential for uh, not only biocontrol, but, but using the vast resources of the biological world to improve the um, ecology and the economics of, of North America. Okay, so that makes sense. We might view this now as, as hubris today, but at the time it was simply confidence in their ability to, you know, sort of engineer the ecological environment for the best outcomes that they were seeking. Yeah, yeah, it, that was, I mean, they, they had the best intentions. Um, they, they thought they were doing good things, obviously. And, and it's, it's a little bit amazing that, and I don't know how many different kinds of things or introductions were attempted, but it's perhaps um, you know fortunate that uh, almost all of those failed because right. <laughs> we might be overrun with many, many more uh, different invasive species. That's an interesting point. Um, on the slender false brome in particular, so this was introduced uh, with the hope of providing forage for rangeland animals. That that's our guess. That's. Okay. That's the one, I mean, the one thing that, that we could think of that, um, that would, would maybe make sense for this particular plant. And so what they did was gather samples from all over Europe. Um, and was it elsewhere as well or just Europe? Um, it was actually um, all over the Mediterranean region, including uh, North Africa uh, um, and Asia. Um, and now they... they they have collections of areas that has actually been um, introduced, like there's collections from Australia, uh, as far east as China. Um, the interesting thing is that, that, you know, they still provide these seeds on request. And so we can order seeds from many parts of the world that are currently inaccessible, um, particularly in, the, in, the, um, in, the, in near Asia and, the, and North Africa. So it's a, uh, it's a great resource for us in terms of being able to do comparative work. Uh, what we found was that the actual um, uh, plants that probably led to the invasion in Oregon uh, were mostly from, or, or actually all of them that we can tell were from, um, from Europe, particularly Western Europe. Okay, so they've got these, this number of samples. They're presumably planting them in a garden so that they can, you know, see how they do, investigate their fitness, see what happens. Yeah. And then uh, what happens next? You know, they, they hybridize, right? Right. So we don't know if, if they uh, just abandoned the gardens or if they just didn't track um, any kind of seedlings that were produced and sort of escaped from the gardens, um, you know, because there's no, uh, uh, you know, records of these kinds of, of range experiments. Um, we don't know for sure. So then these plants, that, and, it, and it was sort of a similar composition of, of sources, both in Eugene and Corvallis, um, were then 
included things from England, from uh, France, from Italy, uh, from Spain, and and so these and Greece and these um, and these same sort of ingredients went into this new hybrid that originated not just once but twice which is also really interesting that you get these parallel invasions one spreading from corvallis and then the other spreading from eugene oregon it sounds almost as though they set up a really interesting experiment on invasive species uh, inadvertently yes <laughs> in retrospect yeah that's exactly what happened they uh they um they kind of uh Kind of did a really cool experiment, but unfortunately, I mean the the we can't we can't ignore the fact that there's been a lot of damage done, of course, because of this invasion. Um, but I should say, I think one of the things that really facilitated the invasion of false brome was not just the um, origin of this of this hybrid, but it was also the um, the activities of, of, of researchers, other researchers in the area, because I think the first place that false brome invaded uh, near Corvallis was um, the McDonald Dunn Experimental Forest. And this is an area where um, foresters use for uh, testing different uh, cutting methods of trees and clear cutting. And they were sharing logging equipment from this forest to other parts of, of Oregon. And so some of the the, um, the larger sort of like invasions that we see in other parts of Oregon appear to be associated with a history of logging. And so we've, you know, kind of connected the dots to, uh, um, uh, you know, make the conclusion that it was probably a lot of this was logging equipment was carrying seeds around uh, different parts of Oregon. Uh, that's interesting itself. You know, I, I think that uh, probably a typical understanding of species invasions would be along the lines of, you know, you get one or two samples somewhere, you know, in the wrong place. Uh, mm-hmm. And then the population just explodes. But, you know, that obviously wasn't the case here. No, and it, and it does. I mean, once it's, I think once it's established in a particular location, then you can get sort of, um, and that's sort of those those movements are maybe you know longer distance uh, uh, you know many miles and then once it's sort of locally established then I see I think you see a, a lot more local dispersal and so what we've seen um, here near Oregon you know, Portland in the Clackamas watershed there's been spread that appears to be primarily um, by uh, uh, people and their dogs, um, uh, recreationists up and down the, the Clackamas watershed, which is um, really active with, uh, with anglers and uh, people just enjoying the river and rafting down the river. Um, and then also uh, perhaps uh, or the information we have suggested also deer might be moving these seeds around uh, locally. But it, it really takes, takes two things. One is the, that, you know, something that moves the seeds. And the other thing is, is, is once the seeds arrive, there needs to be, we think there really needs to be an, uh, some kind of opening in the natural vegetation uh, for false brome to really get established and get a foothold. And that would have been the logged areas. Yeah, and so logging was like ideal for false brome because they, um, you know, the activity of loggers basically destroys the vegetation. Um, and cl- critically, what we've learned is that there's a usually in a, the kind of mixed uh, forests we have here, it's a mixture of deciduous trees and, and conifers, um, and it develops a thick layer of organic material, leaves and needles on, on, the, on the forest floor. And that is often pretty uh, resistant to uh, seeds becoming uh, established. But once you you disrupt that that protective layer, then that opens up things. And so what we've seen is that areas where we find false brome, um, there's usually evidence of a history of, of some kind of disturbance, including there's less, less shrubbery and then there's actually more soil compaction uh, in those areas. So it looks like you know, probably human disturbance uh, of some kind at, at some point that opened up bare ground and and because false brome produces large numbers of seeds it was then able to outcompete other uh, local plants 
That's interesting. Let's talk a little bit about uh, rapid evolutionary change or, or how the false brome adapted, uh, you know, to the environment in Oregon. You know, what sorts of things happen? Because, you know, I think there's often a, a temptation to look at invasive species as being identical or very, very similar to, uh, you know, the original source populations. But, you know, this this one's adapted, hasn't it? Yeah, it's, uh, we've got uh, pretty good evidence that it's it's undergone relatively rapid evolution to adapt to the Oregon climate. And so Oregon's classified as a, a, um, a temperate Mediterranean climate. And, and so this is a, a bit cooler than the standard sort of Mediterranean climate that you would find, uh, say, in Southern California or um, uh, in, in Spain and Italy. Um, and this particular kind of sort of combination of uh, very warm summers and 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 cool wet winters is uh, hardly found in in Europe at all. And so Europe is either you know much wetter in the winters; they have maritime climates, or they uh, or in summers. I'm sorry, um, or they're uh, or they're much hotter and drier in the summer. And so. What we we've seen, and in particular the kinds of, of traits that we focused on, um, were traits associated with with drought. Because when we looked at the combination of, of sources from Europe, and we were able to do this by looking at the actual um, genetic contributions of different uh, source regions in Europe, and then we could we could uh, compile a, a profile of 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 what those climates were like. And we realized that compared to that, that the, the Oregon climate was um, much drier and warmer in the summers um, uh, than um, that particular profile of the sources. And so we focused on drought characters. And what we saw, um, and actually this is the work of Gina Marchini, who was a PhD student in my lab. And what she found was that the uh, shifts in a number of different uh, uh, physiological traits dealing with with um, uh, uh, the water uh, uptake of these plants and also the anatomical characters um, uh, suggested that early in this invasion that the uh, plants that are now successful have shifted these traits and that these traits are genetically determined because she grew them in a common garden all together under the same conditions. And the Oregon plants had significantly different um, shifts in, in sort of drought ad adaptation for these traits compared to the, um, the, the profile we expected if you had just mixed these um, genetic lineages together randomly. And, and so that comparison led to the conclusion that that sure enough, there's been um, pretty rapid adaptive revolution. Um, we think, you know, maybe in about ten generations or so. That's quite quick, and and all of this evolution, uh, you know, in Oregon has been taking place in the last hundred and twenty or so years. Yes. Well, we we don't know the exact date of of the planting of these gardens. Um, we do know that that plant introduction program was pretty active up until about 1930. And so um, it, they, the plantings could have been maybe as early as the, um, you know, up to 1910, but um, certainly before, before 1930. So we've kind of guessed, oh, maybe it was around 1920. So that would be, yeah, around a, a, a hundred years or so of, of time. And these, these plants will generally flower within um, the first two years, uh, under very good conditions, and, and in nature, we think that they they probably flower in the in the first two years. In the greenhouse, they'll flower in in the first season. They'll, within a few months, they go from seed to flowering. So they really have a pretty rapid generation time. Once a plant's established, it can live um, it can live decades. So um, and we know that from some studies that were done in England. Of, of growing these plants there. Okay, and next I had a question about your figure six, which people can find from the link in the show notes. Um, 
But I was curious, you know, it's, first it sets out this establishment of the primary source and then the initial range expansion of the invasive. Um, and then the next one I wanted to ask about was the purging of genetic load and the secondary lag phase that that occasions. And I was just hoping that you could explain that for us a little bit. Right. So this is, this is a, 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 a pretty common phenomenon in um, uh, the, the vast majority of, of plants and animals, I think, have a large amount of what we call genetic load, or it's also called mutational load. And the, this is um, uh, genetic uh, or alleles that are um, uh, effectively deleterious. They'll reduce the fitness of, of the organism, but they're also completely recessive. In other words, if, if they're present in the genome and they're the, a, a normal copy of that same gene available, uh, you don't see their effect at all. And it's only when you uh, start inbreeding, okay? And so then once you, you um, have matings between individuals that share many of the same uh, uh, deleterious mutations, then the individuals that are, that are homozygous, in other words, they have both copies of that deleterious allele. And at that point, then um, the fitness of those offspring are lower. And this is a fairly common phenomenon in, in any plant that um, is outcrossing. Um, and so false brome has what we call a mixed mating system. It can both self and outcross, um, and it has a, a fairly uh, substantial genetic load. The way we test that genetic load is we can do uh, pollinations uh, to flowers uh, through selfing, through self-fertilization of, of the grass flower, or we can do uh, crosses between uh, plants from either the same population or a different population. And when we do that analysis and, we, and then we grow the what we call self-seedlings and outcross seedlings, we see that the, the, the vigor of the self-seedling are substantially lower. And so that's generally called inbreeding depression, and it's due to this genetic load. So purging then is the process where selection removes a lot of those deleterious mutations. And what we have, what we know from both mathematical modeling, um, primarily by uh, Michael Whitlock, and and then also our simulations, is that if you have a, a low rate of gene flow among inbred populations, it kind of infuses um, uh, genetic variation into this very inbred population. That provides opportunities for uh, selection to then replace those deleterious mutations with the normal genes, the normal variants at that particular genetic locus. And so what we see in our simulations is that initially these populations become very inbred very fast because usually as this in the simulation and also in false room in nature the um uh, new populations can be established by a single seed so that means that that one plant grows and it sells and then all of the all of the progeny all of the offspring are cells. And so they're and they're all very related to each other. So any kind of mating is just going to lead to more inbreeding and a decline in the vigor of that population. So that decline in vigor suggests that well, as range expansion starts happening, the rate of that expansion would actually start slowing down um, because populations lose vigor at the leading edge of the range expansion. The process of purging then occurs as gene flow happens among these leading edge, po edge populations. And you can see that in that figure uh, where these, these sort of phalanxes of expansion come into contact at their edges, and we see increases in the fitness of those populations in those contact areas, where we see a warmer color, a redder color popping up, indicating higher fitness. And so then eventually, um, we in these simulations we see complete purging of genetic load uh, because the 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 way we quantified it was actually quite simple. In nature, it's it's going to be a bit more complicated than that, and we do see evidence of purging of genetic load under controlled 
you know, carbon guarding conditions. Um, uh, it's, and we're pretty certain this is happening in nature and having effects in nature, but the purging of genetic load may not be as complete um, uh, in terms of once, once you put these plants out in their natural habitats. And then once this happens, the expansion of the population is accelerated? Yeah, and so and we see that in the simulations that we see this acceleration where, um, and this is kind of the, the scary thing about the false Rome invasion. We think it might be at this tipping point where um, uh, purging is undergoing currently, and as as that happens in the net coming decades, we might actually see uh, uh, an increase in in the in the rate of range expansion because it. If you look at um, one of the other figures, you can see that the potential range of this plan is, is quite large, way up into um, into Canada and down into California, and it's it's only filled a small part of that so far. And so the the potential for expansion is 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 really is really quite high. Okay, so we have this you know sort of uh, broadened understanding of the way that in, an invasive species, at least one such as this, um, you know, uh, becomes invasive. Mm -hmm. The next thing I, I guess to understand is, you know, what can we take from this information? You know, is this does this give us any sort of roadmap to uh, preventing similar invasions in the future? Yeah, I think in terms of of preventing future invasions, um, it's a little difficult just because of of uh, human behavior. We have, a, of course, our transportation systems. Um, generate kind of an ideal uh, transport system for invasive species. Because what you want for an invasive species is you want to be successful under this particular model that, that we're proposing is that you would have um, individuals from different geographic regions in the native range then be concentrated in a location in the, in the new in the new continent or the new range. And so you think about it, um, you know, we have cities, we have ports, uh, uh, we have airports. Um, and so the potential for, um, you know, ships coming from around the world to a particular location uh, 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 in say North America is, is really high. And what that, we call this directed dispersal. And what that does is it, is it basically, um, concentrates the, uh, uh, I think, the potential for different genetic lineages of the same species to come together and then, and then to hybridize. And so um, I think that being you know, diligent about making sh or reducing the transport of species on, on ships and, and other modes of transportation is, is really important. Um, and, and that may be the best that we can do. Um, I also have, you know, spoken with with range managers and we talked about the the potential for, you know, instead of going out to the leading edge of an invaded range and, and finding the little populations, really you want to get those big healthy populations that are maybe uh, have purged more genetic load or become more adapted to the local conditions and remove those and sort of the, those are the ones that are, we think are providing the, the sources for um, an invasion. But I should say, I think, you know, most managers and, and biologists working in the area of invasive species have come to the realization that um, once a species is established, um, it's, it's uh, almost impossible to eradicate. And so we can hope to slow down the spread, uh, but we probably... Uh, it's, it generally may not be possible to completely uh, eliminate a, a plant or animal once it's arrived in a, in a new look. So prevention being obviously the first and most important step to whatever extent you can pull that off. Yeah, and and, and part of the, I guess, the, the thing that keeps invasion biologists awake at night is, is the idea that, um, you know, like false brome, there's a number of of what we call sleepers out there. And so, you know, for decades, false brome was uh, under the radar that's not considered a, um, a pest at all. And it wasn't until 
um, the late 1900s that it really started spreading and then the alarm bells went off. And so the, the fear is that there's, there's many more sort of sleeper uh, species out there that maybe they look relatively benign, they're just, you know, not being particularly aggressive, but they're um, uh, uh, perhaps um, have the potential to, in the future to become a, a more aggressive invader. So these would be species uh, about which we'd sort of, you know, looked them over and gone, well, these don't seem to be particularly uh, vigorous in their in their expansion. Uh, but in reality, they're simply going through one of these lag periods that the false brome did. Exactly. The, yeah, so this, this, this lag phase, yeah. And sometimes it's like, you know, garden plants, we bring them from around the world, and those are the ones that become invasive. Other times, it's... Uh, uh, like we talk about the um, the ports where, where where plants and animals are coming in uh, uh, on ships and and other means of transportation, um, and then other times it's uh, um, people have you know introduced um, uh, plants for uh, like in this case uh, range management. So it, there's there's a, a a number of of mechanisms for plants to move around the world. It's, it's all, it's all by humans. Of course. And on a slightly cheerier note, um, you mentioned uh, near the end of your article about the possibility of using some of these phenomena as a means of helping uh, managers adapt to climate change and perhaps increasing the vigor of native species um, as they need to alter their ranges in order to adjust to changing circumstances. Yeah. And, and so I think that um, in the, in conservation biology, um, historically, um, hybridization um, has almost been a bit of a dirty word because um, conservation biologists have been, you know, afraid that particularly um, uh, range-limited species, these uh, threatened or, or rare species, um, if they started hybridizing with another species that was more widespread you could get what's called genetic swamping. And so the, the more abundant species would basically uh, um, uh, erase the, the, uh, the, the, the range limited one. And so um, there's been a lot of fear about hybridization. And also when we do restoration work, I've found that many restoration um, biologists are very concerned about having uh, local sources for their seeds to do to um, to plant um, gardens. But my argument has been that that this is sort of a, a, a an unnatural uh, situation. That historically, we know that plants and animals have undergone um, changes in their ranges over the last twenty thousand years, and in the process. You have different genetic lineages coming together and, and intermixing, um, undergoing hybridization, or what we sometimes call admixture, and that's that's a natural process. And the problem that I think many of our our plants and animals face now is that they they are um, naturally in, somewhat inbred, uh, and so that reduces their vigor. And then also the the world's changing, you know, underneath their feet so that, that they're becoming less adapted to the local conditions. And the other problem that we've created is that the natural habitats that they occupy are, are much more fragmented than they were in the past. And so natural areas uh, are separated by large areas of agriculture or, or urban development. And so in terms of like, you know, expecting plants and animals to naturally make the shifts uh, in geographic region that they might need to make or the, the shifts and adaptation to the local conditions that they might need to make, um, uh, we've really made it much more difficult for them. And so um, one thing that we can consider would be sort of promoting uh, what have been historical natural processes, which is this, uh, um, you know, mixing uh, different genetic lineages together. Um, and I'm not necessarily saying that they're strongly genetically different. They're just from different geographic regions. And maybe, you know, looking at them, they would look basically the same. But they have different um, 
genetic complements. And so once you mix them together, then you you elevate the level of genetic variation. And that's that's the goal. If you if you want to promote adaptive evolution, selection really needs um, a large amount of genetic variation. So the 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 more we can do that, the um, the better the 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 better the the chances of of many more of these plants and animals uh, to to survive into the future. And and that's that's really the fear is that we might lose um, many species um, in, in the coming decades. It, it sounds like uh, attempting to maintain species without allowing hybridization or purposely trying to avoid it is sort of, a, in a sense, playing the game on hard mode and introducing a challenge that would you would argue we don't necessarily need at all. Yeah, I, I think it's, you know, the focus has been, um, and, and even the, um, our federal laws are focused on, on these uh, species as these sort of static entities that they don't change, you know, and they even, uh, the Endangered Species Act even in some cases excludes hybrids from consideration. And so there's been this, this such a focus on, you know, what a species is that um, we kind of lose sight of the fact that these species have a history and they also have a future. And so that history has involved a lot of uh, um, uh, opportunities for exchange of genetic material with other uh, species and, and subspecies and, and you know, genetic lineages. We have lots of names for these things. So, so that the natural process is, is, is you know, having opportunities to, to exchange genetic material. And so my um, suggestion would be we should focus on the processes, evolutionary processes that have produced this great amazing biodiversity that we have, rather than trying to preserve the, the particular species that happen to exist at this point in time. That's a fascinating perspective. And uh, Dr. Cruzan, thank you very much for joining me. But before we go, um, I was wondering, would you like to would you like to point our listeners uh, who might be interested in learning more in the direction of uh, of some literature that they might be reading? Yeah, I mean, I think there's um, a, a number of papers uh, cited in uh, uh, the um, the bioscience article that uh, would be good starting points. Um, and then also uh, I have uh, a book on plant evolutionary biology. It's called Evolutionary Biology, a Plant Perspective, uh, published by Oxford University Press. And that's particularly the geared for students who are uh, advanced biology uh, uh, students in their, in their senior year, beginning grad students and, and researchers. And it um, uh, includes a lot of these kinds, this kind of information um, and and um, these kinds of examples of uh, uh, not just invasive species, but many aspects of, of plant biology that have affected their evolutionary uh, biology. Uh, we'll include links in the show notes. Thank you very much for joining me today. Okay, thank you. And that concludes this episode of Bioscience Talks. Just a reminder, the journal Bioscience is published by Oxford University Press on behalf of the American Institute of Biological Sciences, and is made possible by the support of our members and donors. Thank you, and talk to you next time.